and uh, this is the day to celebrate our unity in diversity and uh, india is a perfect example and this is a day to raise public awareness on solidarity and this is a day to promote uh, solidarity to achieve uh, sustainable human development goal the development goal including poverty eradication and that that's why we have chosen the day and uh, you know uh, our speaker distinguished speaker dr jaji bawen and uh, she is a an anthropologist with special research interest in social and cultural worlds of children and young people this is a much neglected aspect in anthropology and uh, she is one of the few researchers who has done a really good original work uh, on the cultural world of children and young people in india and in odisha and uh, a key focus of our work is on better integration of uh, young people's perspective and experiences within the communities and institutions that they are members of jadhi scholar research uh, uh, follow on from uh, prior work in an ngo in the field of education in australia the specific and sub saharan africa and partially in india in australia jaji was director of an early childhood uh, center in melbourne and ran uh, i mean she ran several preschool western australia and queensland uh, school preschool including in perth uh, in a indigenous community with the support of uh, the elderly people from that community in kenya jaji held a position of education secretary for 4 years and co-founded a children's village for homeless young people um, in the rift valley during uh, this period when talking of uh, taking up doctoral study in anthropology at the australian national university jaji accepted the mentorship with uh, embracing for me to announce professor deepak kumar vera and begin her uh, exploration of children's peer play in odisha at the australian national university jaji was uh, mentored in visual anthropology by leading uh, anthro ethnographic feeling maker dr david maxwell whose film ethnographies of childhood in india are renowned jaji is currently situated in the center of aboriginal economic policy research at the anu his research interest in the field of uh, education ethnography this is very interesting education ethnography critical indigenous study indigenous education visual anthropology play study gender study and research into identities and belonging i mean after completing her research on play jaji held a postdoctoral position to research marginalized student experiencing of school in india in the light of the push of uh, towards gender private i mean greater privatization of schooling in uh, the indian subcontinent much of her research is focused uh, geographically on india she has also worked on research project within australia the pacific and indonesia jaji holds uh, adjunct fellow position at the university of uh, sunshine coast and the australian national university jaji has lectured and tutored in a variety of anthropology courses graduate and post graduate at the australian national university she is currently writing an independent professional development course on the importance of uh, child adult relationship in school in out of home care setting this course emphasizes the nature of social relationship rather than the usual binary student centered versus teacher centered approach uh, with this 
brief introduction, I welcome you, uh, Dr. Jaji Bhavan, to you. this invited lecture. And uh, we are very pleased to have you. And I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, your uh, uh, presentation and subsequent uh, deliberation. Uh, yes. This forum is very vibrant, and uh, it's mm. not about uh, the number. Uh, you will find uh, good comments on your lecture. So yes. today, you know, this session will be chaired by Professor Vijay Sa. He was um, former head, Department of Anthropology, University of Allahabad. He did his BA and MA, BA Honours and MA in Anthropology from Ranchi University. And he was awarded PhD for his fascinating research work on the Nicobari, on, uh, in, in the Nicobar Ireland under the supervision of late Professor L.P. Vidyarthi. Professor Sa's main area of interest in anthropology have been teaching anthropological theories and conducting field research among the particularly vulnerable tribal groups of the country, particularly the tribes of Andaman and Nicobar Ireland. Professor Sa is the editor-in-chief of a sage journal, The Oriental Anthropology, and his latest book, Experiencing Anthropology in the Nicobar uh, Archipelago, has been brought out by Rotledge. His forthcoming book is on anthropological thought from evolutionism to postmodernism and after. So, uh, and I present you both uh, the chairperson. <laughs> And uh, today's uh, invited speaker, Professor Jaji Brown. And now, with this brief introduction, um, I would like to hand over the Google Meet stage to the president, uh, Professor Vijay Sa. Uh, it's your turn. Thank you, Professor Deepak Behra. I once again. On behalf of the United India Anthropology Forum, as also on my personal behalf, I welcome Dr. Jazzy Bowen and all of you in this webinar. Actually, <clears throat> Dr. Jazzy would be speaking on playing on mother ground. I think that many anthropologists, especially the students and the research scholars, might not be aware of what, what is meant by playing on mother's ground. Dr. Jazzy will be telling in detail, but even then, I wish just to speak something on it. As a matter of fact, anthropology has never hesitated to incorporate ideas, methodologies, concepts, etc., from any other discipline. And this playing on mother ground is especially for the children. And it is, I think, borrowed from psychology. Probably Dr. Jazzy will be telling more. As far as the children's study is concerned, I think it was first Margaret Mead who started in 1928 and who is said to have been the founder of the Psychological School of Anthropology. The techniques that she applied from psychology were the projective tests. This technique of playing on mother's ground is quite different. It's quite different. Margaret Mead applied the psychological techniques in her study of the Samoa in 1928, coming of age in Samoa, and later in coming of age in Samoa, she was concerned with the early childhood socialization. 
and in growing up in new guinea late childhood socialization which he did in papua new guinea so the children study has been now for almost 100 years because in 1921 at the age of 21 in 1921 at the age of 21 i think margaret mead had gone to samoa to study the samoan children what is mean by playing on mother ground is i think every serious anthropologist uses this technique without knowing knowingly or unknowingly this technique is used because playing ground or playing on mother ground is in fact is uh, what is mean by it is in an open place adjacent to the workplace of i have been i am not quoting any definition which i understand it that there are certain open places adjacent to the workplace of the mother or the father or the both where children play with their peer group and <clears throat> uh the parents not only do their work but they also watch their children watch their children that they do not quarrel or they do not i mean so that they play peacefully and the children not only play but they also watch their parents their father mother or both you know and learn the things of their own culture so this is what is meant i understand by playing on mother ground well one more thing is to be observed while studying such early childhood that is pretend play pretend play now pretend play has also to be understood we have seen that the children they pretend to do something such as making a house along the beach the sand is there they will make a house and play with their children different types of games they play you know that also suggests that how how i mean <clears throat> they learn the things of their own culture well david lancy david f lancy has also written a book that was published in 1996 that playing on mother's ground cultural routines of children's development this was published in 1996 this deals with child development in pelas society in liberia isn't it i think uh, this one so these of course very less studies perhaps have been done and uh, we shall we shall be happy to listen to um dr jazi um dr deepak is already here who is um, who has been the chairperson of the anthropology of children youth and childhood of the iuas international union of anthropological and ethnological sciences he is himself an expert in the study of children and childhood uh with these words and a brief introduction already dr jazid's introduction has been given by uh, my colleague dr professor deepak behra and i have tried just to make some clarity or some about the concept of playing on mother ground and pretend play and how david lancy has worked uh, in liberia among the um, pele um, society and uh, he has done fantastic work um, that how the children um, uh, they do not i mean those children who do not attend the, attend the formal schools um, they learn uh, everything of the culture uh, well i would also like to tell you that i said that the anthropologists who do serious work 
they 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 have for example i myself my work on the nicobar islands hmm. uh, there is an island that is supposed to be the land of wizard and very superstitious and very orthodox inhospitable and inaccessible also the island of chaura well chaura people make some pots you know the pots making is very very simple thing uh, but wheel pottery is very simple to make you know they make it by their hands only and when i talk about the chaura pot then i also have to tell you that it has one of very i mean significant thing in the life of the nicobarese people because the chaura pots are supposed to be two things harbinger of fortune first of all and second it is believed that if water is boiled in chaura pot and a child is bathed then he or she will be immunized against the black magic because that has been made by the chaurians and chaura every chaurian is supposed to be the wizard mm. Mm. is believe that they can change the direction of the wind and the wave now i have a number of photographs you know and i have given in my book also experiencing anthropology in the nicobar archipelago that women making chaura pot and nearby a lot of children you know they have been playing you know so she is keeping watch on the children also at the same time the girls so girl has has been because this is made by women only not by men so the girls are watching that how she has been making by their hands only because it takes sometimes one month to make one pot it is so laboriously prepared you know likewise along the beach sea beach the the father or the guardian of the children they make toy canoe toy canoe chaurians are the greatest navigators in the entire just like kula exchange they make very very long journeys for traditional system of exchange you know so they make uh, toy canoes and the toy canoes are carried by the children they go to the beach and then they they, they just put the, on the water and follow it you know sails are made of leaves you know they are toys you know this is how they learn and in future they become uh, great navigators and while they play in the beach the uh, the father is also watchful that uh, the child doesn't go beyond certain limit of the sea beach you know so this is how i understand that uh, um, playing on mother ground um, that is uh, the workplace where the parents have been doing work there and in the nearby in open space you know uh, the children are playing and both of them are watching each other the children learning the techniques or and the cultural things at the same time the parents are watching this is what i understand you know so i think that every serious anthropologist who has done work you know among any community knowingly or unknowingly he applies this technique and he is always watchful of these things also with these words uh, i am also very eager to listen to dr jazi and um, uh, you are welcome thank you yeah thank you very much uh, yeah okay dr jazi now we see right. um, okay yeah. um yeah. so before i start i just like to tell you where we are where i'm speaking to you from which is uh, the hills behind the sunshine coast in queensland This is known as Jinnabara and Kabi Kabi country. Um for millennia the First Nations people here which is the Kabi Kabi peoples have been caring for this country and before I start I'd like to just pay my respects to the elders past and current who are continuing in various ways to care for country and whose sovereignty was never ceded even though British colonialism has now created the settler state here. So my respects to them as we start this um lecture and I'd also like to um offer my you know great thanks to Professor Deepak Pahera and to Vijay uh, Sahai for um this welcome um into your um community of anthropologists. 
It's a, such a great privilege for me to be amongst you. Um, you know, doing field work, uh, I didn't get a lot of chance to mix too much with, um, with Indian scholars. It was, you know, I was out mostly um, spending all of my time with children. <laughs> Um, but it is really great to have this opportunity to, to share with you my field work and to hear your thoughts on it, um, which I, I will find in, tremendously helpful and valuable, I'm sure. So I'm going to um, turn now to my um, slideshow presentation and talk my way through that. Um, and I would just like to say in, in thank you, um, Professor uh, Vijay, for um, your reference to David Lancey's work. David Lancey's work did inspire me greatly, you know, as an, an uh, ethnographer of children's play. Um, and you're right, there are um, elements of, of exactly what you were speaking about um, that have inspired me. But as we go through the talk, you'll see that there's another way that I'm thinking about the mother ground that um, will become clear as I, as I talk. But first of all, I want to again, just celebrate that you've invited me to speak on International Human Solidarity Day. Um, and um, Professor Behera already said a few words about it. So as we know, the dictionary definition of solidarity is that when one person or group of people um, stands in support of others because they share feelings, opinions, and aims. And international human solidarity is where we, we, we share our aims with all. As the UN defines human solidarity, it is the fundamental value of um, our global community's relations. And it it underlies the very purpose of the United Nations to draw people and nations together and especially to guarantee um, support for those who are most marginalized. And in our own discipline of anthropology, we've been introduced by Durkheim to two kinds of human, solidar uh, of human solidarity, which he calls mechanical and organic. And um, both of them refer to the ways that human societies achieve social cohesiveness. Um, and he, he talks about them in terms of two types of solidarity. Um, solidarity of um, smaller societies that have fairly similar forms of um, labor amongst all, uh, labor and ex division of labor and exchange amongst all members of the society and versus societies where there's a very complex division of labor, um, but still that's all there to achieve a social solidarity or human solidarity. So for Durkheim, this whole concept of solidarity is not really um, a, a, even a value that you're trying to apply with your conscious mind. It's something that more or less that societies achieve um, almost unconsciously. Um, and, and it is also related both to um, exchange, forms of economic exchange for the well-being of all, um, and, and that is achieved through division of labor, but it's also um, about shared values. Um, up to the 1970s, most many of um, the states of the world were um, premised on notions of a welfare state. And this was the kind of pragmatic, practical way that we enacted human solidarity. But as we know, the 1980s onwards dismantled that with structural adjustment. And apart from grassroots movements for human solidarity, and, and of course those aims within the United Nations, the political and economic pragmatics of enacting human solidarity have been largely replaced with wholesale promotion of individual endeavors and the privatization of how we provision care to all. 
And so there's really quite immense scope for us as anthropologists to investigate the enactment of the values of human solidarity in our current political, economic and social setups. Because as we know, curiosity about human solidarity is probably what brought most of us to engage with the discipline of anthropology in the first place. Our primary topic as anthropologists is to understand what constitutes us as a species, what it is that unites us and what it is to be human. And also to understand this interplay of diversity and unity across time and place. And now we've had 2020, um, which has been a year to powerfully call attention to our common world connections. That is how our existence as humans is entangled with other species and with the elements that make up our world and ourselves as part of it. Perhaps more than ever, notions of human solidarity and anthropology as a discipline are compelled to recognize the web of human and more than human relationships that make up our existence and impact our common um, humanity. This idea of entangled relational common world existence has also got a growing influence in childhood studies. Probably all of you know that the anthropology of childhood rests on the foundational idea that childhood is socially constructed as well as biological. Probably one of the strongest um, social constructions about children's lives um, is that um, proposed by political philosophers of liberal democracy. And they see children's life trajectories as following this linear development from a blank slate infancy to an end point of um, the autonomous, rational, mature adult. Um, and this is, you know, many of the um, political philosophers of liberal democracy, such as Locke, Rousseau and Dewey, they all spoke about childhood. For example, Locke spoke about, you know, the blank slate child and liberal democracy. Rousseau spoke about childhood as an innocent and liberal democracy. And Dewey spoke about liberal democracy and the importance of practical education for children to achieve that. So you can see that political philosophy and the concept of the child have always worked hand in hand. But all of this has sort of um, focused on, you know, the child as innocent, the child as a blank slate and, um, and this trajectory towards the maturity, maturation of a rational, autonomous um, uh, adult. Um, but critical childhood studies are now starting to deconstruct some of the certainty about this construction to expose some of the myths and, and the cultural masculinism and some of the colonial assumptions that are struct in, structured into the origins of this um, trajectory of what childhood is. Conceptions about children and childhoods are being reconfigured to shift away from this future state of idealized mature autonomy to common world's contact zones among children, between children and adults, and between children and their environments. That is children and their relationship with um, not only the human world, but the other than human world, that is um, plants, animals, and, and the environment. In this new approach, the theme of interdependence emerges as a reality, not a limitation, which critiques cultural ideals of autonomy and independence as mere myths of adulthood. That means not even adults are actually autonomous. And also it focuses on um, celebrating cognitive diversity of young people um, compared with adults and also emphasizes the diversity which this diversity emphasizes diversity in ways of being human in common world relations. Um, so the, 
we have to also know that there's not one singular way of being a child. The context of children's lives generate a diversity of experiences and perspectives. And whenever it comes to diversity in young people's knowledge making in post-colonial contexts, we have to situate young people's interactions by tracing the continuing effects of um, colonialism on the um, post-colonial forms of everyday cultural, social and material practices in the post-settler and non-settler colonies, rather than thinking just in terms of an essentialized, atemporal or non-historicized um, cultural diversity. That is, you know, not everything is just, you know, a timeless cultural, um, essential cultural um, artifact. You know, it could be that that's the product of um, post-colonialism. For critical and post-colonial childhood studies, it reminds us that colonialism engendered a violent insertion into modernity for the majority of the world's peoples. And in this process, institutions and concepts of rights and freedoms, even though they are um, being taken up, they still remain indelibly um, ham hampered you know, or hindered by um, that earlier project of violence and conquest. Um, and those reverberations, they persist, which results, as we see in India, in a vast array of different childhoods, even when universal rights are introduced as a common framework. So in this paper today, I'm going to share with you my research into young people's play in Mayurbanj district, northern Orissa. And I'm looking at children's play as a way of investigating how young people embody their, their embodied experience and knowledge making about place via the adults' constructions of space and place. As we know, adults assume primary roles in structuring and governing space and place. They set the territorial and proprietal boundaries and landmarks, and they govern children's place and expected roles within different geographic locales. But within that, those sort of predeterminations, children then go on and re experience and reimagine and en enact meanings about around place in distinctive ways within these pre predeterminations. So some of the key focus points that I want to share today, oops, I'll just go back, are that we can use play as a pivot to understand children's social and environmental inter interactions. I'm also going to fo focus on a children's mapping of their local area and compare that with a hidden play map. And I want to talk about um, the porous boundaries of the magic circle of games, children's games. And I want to look at the relationship between the core spatial resources and the cultural motifs of any environment and children's modes of play. I also want to look at children's resourcefulness in um, creating play props, and I want to look at play amidst social and environmental transformations. So probably most of you already know where Mayurbanj is in northern Arissa, um, and as we all know, it was um, a sovereign princely state until 1949, when it merged into post-independence Orissa, becoming one of Orissa's 30 districts. And as you probably know, it, it contains significant environmental areas, including the um, rich biodiversity of the Similipal Ranges, sharing borders with West Bengal. And the population is comprised of um, a uh, majority number of Santal and Ho communities, especially in the study area of this research, which was in the outer villages of Rai Rangpur subdivision. Oops. Um, most of the households there were engaged in um, a combination of paddy cultivation and forestry, um, supplemented by migration for different types of labor. So here's a couple of questions. Why study play? How do you study play and what's a play study anyway? So especially when we're engaging with um, young people who reside in one of the um, 
disadvantaged districts of one of um, India's quite economically disadvantaged states in some respects. Of course, we know there's a lot of development going on as well, where research, but the, the sort of filtering down of that doesn't always reach the ground level. Um, so when we have, you know, issues, um, pressing issues of education and ongoing issues of child labor and um, issues of child health, why would one bother to study play when you have all of these important things that are deserving our attention? Um, my reasons for studying play was to explore it as a human cultural expression in its own right. And in this way, to give dignity to what young people do. I also wanted to study play as a way of better understanding the everyday experiences, perspectives and commitments of young people in their own environmental and social worlds. Um, and I also see play as a way of approaching conceptual con conundrums about the very nature of our human social interactions and our non and our human non-human interactions, including with the environment. So what is play anyway? I I love this photograph, which was taken by um, one of the children when I did a photo voice um, activity with the children, which was giving them some cameras to document their own village and also to document the games that they were playing. But instead, very often what they would do with both the video camera and with the still camera was to immediately start doing dramatic um, play with the camera. And this is a, a, a very um, <laughs> fun example of it. You know, they take uh, that, that very sober village studio portraiture photography um, and they also take the very routine um, mode of transport in the village, which is the bicycle, and they play with it in a, in a totally different way. I mean, everybody is, is usually carrying a passenger when they're riding. I mean, very often are carrying a passenger, but they're taking this to a ridiculous extreme with one, two, three, four, five people on the bike. Um, so they're playing with the possibilities in um, quite a wry and funny way. Um, one of the foremost scholars of play is Brian Sutton Smith. He was a, not an anthropologist, but a folklorist. And after about five decades of studying play, he wrote um, a book which, which uh, kind of summed up his investigations of a lifetime. And in the end, his, his primary way of looking at play was as adaptive potential. So for Brian Sutton Smith, humans play's primary purpose is not enculturation or socialization into a social order. And it is not even cognitive development towards intellectual maturity. The primary purpose of play is to avert calcification of either a social order or the mind of an individual player through exercising flexibility and the delight of temporary uncertainty. Play is engaging open-endedness as a field of possibilities. The minute you start a cricket match, you don't know who is going to win, who is going to lose, what is going to happen with each bowl, you don't know. So this open-endedness is that uh, you know, uncertainty. As a foremost preoccupation of young people, play as adaptive potential highlights their agentive and creative relations with the changing social and spatial worlds that they inhabit. So there was two, two modes of looking at play. When I uh, came back from doing field work and I needed to start writing up my thesis, uh, again, I was trying to understand play through, um, through various lenses of theory. And there's a whole body of work, which was the pre-1970s anthropological work that looked um, in a similar way to David Lancy at play as a mode of socialization. And then there was the post-1970s approach, which as we know, the post-1970s really started focusing on um, agency. And it looked at play as um, innovation, transformation, creativity um, and uh, you know all of this kind of thing. So 
I was thinking, okay, my problem is that the play that I saw in Mayurbanj doesn't neatly fit into an exclusive one or the other of this. Rather, there is a synthesis. Play is both um, uh, influenced by the social and environmental context into which children are being socialized, and it is adaptive and creative and innovative. And so I didn't see a model that I could write my thesis into, so I created the play as interaction model. And this model explores the ways that young players are both shaped by and shape the places that they inhabit. This model of play as interaction draws on notions of inactivism. And so it, it's looking at play through these five elements. First is embodiment, that play is a dynamic sensory motor coupling with the human and non-human agents and aspects of one's world. Second, that it's, it's got the element of autonomy um, of each player, that they are, um, they, they engage in some form of operational closure on self-other relations to generate a sense of autonomous identity, which generates the feelings of I will or I won't. For example, just imagine a little child with a ball and they, they think, today I'm going to bounce the ball 10 times without dropping it. And then tomorrow they say, no, today I'm going to uh, bounce the ball without stop 30 times, you know? So this is that autonomy where they set themselves challenges. Um, but that autonomy, as we, we talked about with, you know, relationality, if we jump to number five, emergence, um, play is all ab also about emergence, that is, Autonomy is not absolute. It, it operates in relationship with others. And play is about um, this emergence. That is that um, you play with others. And when you interact with others, and a new entity is formed, which is more than the sum of just you and the other person, it has its own dynamic that gets generated. And that's an emergence um, property that gets generated. And this happens both in the interplay between, say, two children or a whole team of children, um, but it also happens with children and um, aspects of the material environment that they play with. And then another aspect of the play, as we go to number three point, is experience. That is that play rests on a lived, felt aspect. And this is not just feeling for no purpose. The feelings are about clarifying our commitment, and priori uh, which which are, we need to be prioritised over simply um, symbolic significance, and that play is also about sense making. It's about casting a web of significance on the world that we inhabit. Um, that is both our social world and our spatial or environmental world. So the features of this model of play as interaction is that it synthesizes the binary play as socialization versus play as creative transformation by saying that children who are playing have one eye on what is within their environment and the other eye on what if. And that what if is, hey, imagine if I could do this or imagine if I could do this. Imagine if I could turn this branch into... Um, uh, a magic horse, you know, or something like that. So it's imagination. Um, and also play synthesizes the binary play as a psychological phenomenon versus play as a sociological phenomenon. Um, play is simultaneously social um, or performative and psychological or affective and cognitive. So how to study play? I used mixed methodologies. Um, I, I lived in Mayurbanj district for most of the seasonal cycles of 2008, um, resided in um, um, a village um, on the sort of outer edges of Rairangpur subdivision. Um, and I had daily informal conversations with um, small groups of children and individuals, as well as families, as well as teachers in the local school and so forth. Um, when I uh, wanted to study play, I followed um, scholars William Cossaro and Mandel, who talked about the least adult role. And that is that 
even though we are adults, so we don't inhabit the same sort of peer generation as children, but we can reach some shared understandings through acting together on objects led by children. So a lot of what I did in my play research was allowing young people to lead me. And it was very easy to do because they were the authorities in their area and on their games. And I was the dummy that always needed to learn because I already always didn't know their rules and their um, the places where they played and so on. So they were very happy to lead me and teach me. Um, so I engaged almost every day in after school play with a group of elementary school age children. And I also did some intervillage research. So I selected a, a, a most developed um, uh, village of the rural block, um, the least developed village of the rural block, which was a mountain village and a medium developed village. And I examined the differences in play between these different locales. I also did some mapping exercises with children. And after some months, I introduced digital recording using photo voice and video voice with children, which is introducing them to the use of cameras and enabling them to document um, their own um, worlds through that. I also did eliciting written, written texts from school students in um, one of the schools. Uh, as um, Professor Vijay Sahai mentioned, play has so many forms, make-believe, dramatic play, games, um, competitive games that are tests of skill, and um, games of chance, which is like dice games and so on. And then there's another category of playful activity, which is dizzy-making play, things like swinging, um, uh, spinning, spinning around so that a child will, you know, get so dizzy that they might fall on the ground and just see the whole world spinning around them. Riding on mobile platforms and speeding and all of these things that alter your perception. Even tree climbing, when kids try and climb to the top of trees and they get that sort of stomach drop of um, a different perspective on the world. All of this is altered perception. Um, that children are aiming to achieve through Elinx play. And then there's another category of play, which is just what a lot of the kids just call time pass, which is joking with each other, roaming around, exploring, and attention to the, to the small details of any context. Um, and another form was when the young people were making their own play props, um, which we'll look at um, uh, in the course of this. So as we said, there's many kinds of play and I can't concentrate on all of them in just one lecture. So, lecture, so I'm just going to focus on games and the spatial environment. But before we get to that, I just want to talk about a, a mapping activity that I did with the children. And that was after some time, a, a whole group of kids and I, we walked around this whole village with a very large piece of paper and the children were drawing um, their road and their well and their pond and their, all the features of their village, including every single house and a little list of who lived in each house. So they were helping me to get to know their village and we were doing this mapping exercise. But after I'd lived in the village for some time, I was introduced to an imagined map of the village from the perspective of play. And this was only revealed to me gradually over time. So that many places that are, were reimagined, for example, the pond and the bathing gut, the post harvest rice fields, and certain areas which I then came to know as danger areas or risque areas. So for example, the pond and the gut, they immediately would say that that's where we go for bathing and that's where we go for washing our clothes. But then when you came down to it, that it was actually the seat of so many different games, both in the pond and on the edge of the pond. And the post harvest rice fields um, after the, in the winter season were the place where only at that time they would play um, a hockey variant. Um, what was it called? Chakri, Chakri. Um, 
So this map was hard to capture two dimensionally. The river, for example, it had certain games that you only played during the flood, you know, um, and so everywhere had a, had a play dimension. So it became pretty clear that play is a subcurrent activity that's little remarked on yet imbues great potency and significance into place. And I just like to suggest that if you just imagine for a moment from yourself, uh, if you just imagine somewhere that you cherished as a childhood, as a child in your own childhood, and um, I wonder whether for you, that place that you loved very much, whether that was a place that has a play um, memory attached to it. Play is entwined with the natural environment in, in this village context. And cherished play spaces are a fundamental core of our experience and identity. Here we see a picture um, of one of the villages where I was working. And um, you can see the road. Now, as I mentioned, that would have just been drawn as the road. But here you can see it's not the road, it's the cricket pitch. So, and here is the pond. And uh, initially that was where you wash your clothes and have your bath. But here, no, it's not. It is, it's, it's the site of many games. So when we talk about children's games or any games, even adult games, all games start with the demarcation of what uh, Johannes Huizinger calls the magic circle. That encloses a space within an existing space where humans arbitrate the rules. Think of a football field or a game board. Once you're inside that space as a player, then you follow the rules that are created for that spot. For Huizinger, Humans are homo ludens or game players and their creation of game magic circles are the prototype of all civilizational institutions and systems and their spatial demarcations from law courts with their wigs and gowns to operating theatres with masks and gowns to parliament house and the military. All of these uh, rely on that, that uh, proclivity of humans to um, to imagine enclosing spaces and creating the rules of the game for that place. But that kind of suggests almost as though that that um, circle is sort of cut off from what's outside of it. But uh, that's not what you actually see. Rather, the boundaries of that magic circle are porous. There are ongoing interactions between what's going on inside and outside the game's magic circle. I just like to talk about two games that were being played in the cemetery of a Ho hamlet on a festival day. As some of you might know, the um, Ho community do not cremate um, their deceased. They, um, they bury them and place um, huge, huge megalithic gravestones on top of the um, grave of their um, ancestor who is there. And usually these cemeteries are situated right in the center of the village, if not um, occasionally in the center of the compound of the home family. Um, I was in a Ho hamlet on a festival day and was present while there were two games going on um, in the Ho cemetery. Um, in one of the huge gr uh, gravestones, about 50 years earlier, a game board for um, I think it was Das Pachish game was engraved into the um, into the gravestone, and some uh, young adult men and some children were playing Das Pachish with um, uh, dice made of split tamarind seeds and um, little stones for stones and sticks for counters. Um, and in another part of the cemetery, some younger children who are only about seven seven years old were playing Chasey and their particular game of Chasey was such that um, the one who was chasing had to tag you, but everybody was not allowed to touch the ground. They could only leap from one gravestone to another. And if anybody fell off and hit the ground, they immediately became the, the, the chaser. 
and everybody else had to run away from them. Um, so what we can see is that this is the porosity of the magic circle. So here, um, the, the gravestones were game sites. Um, one of the games was Chasey and the other one was a board game. So, um, and yet, so that had a, a particular meaning associated with that. And it had another meaning, which was the meanings of the cemetery environment itself, which was subtly exerting its own significances, um, which were relevant for the players, even if that relevance was backgrounded while they played their games, but still it had its own meaning. So what I'm saying here is that what's going on inside the magic circle is, is also an engagement with what's going on outside it. So ideas about porous boundaries, like ideas about our entanglement with, um, you know, elements of our world, highlights the connections between children's games and the core motifs and resources of a spatial context. And in this talk, I want to really concentrate on mati or soil or earth as a core motif. So in this particular area, agriculture and forestry were the predominant livelihoods. And uh, they, they did their agriculture through bullock plows and natural methods of soil fertility, um, supplemented with forestry. And in this context, soil was a dominant motif economically for livelihood, culturally um, and ritually. For Mayurbanj Mayur residents, the ground itself is mother. So I am not um, wishing to move away from David Lancey's use of play on the mother ground, but I wish to add to it to say that in this context, the earth itself is, is um, mother. Uh, some of the examples of the cultural motifs um, adult determined of soil um, as uh, as um, U.A. Skoda spoke of um, a lot of these communities, he, he referred to them as deshia, which is this combination or this symbiotic relationship between people who identify as, as one or another of the scheduled castes, as well as people who identify as either Ho or Samtal, and they're all living um, and interacting with each other. So amongst the weaver communities, the bride collects soil in a brass pot on the morning of her marriage. And then she goes back and her mother is sitting on a little raised earth platform and the, the bride will, and she takes seven children, I suppose representing fertility um, with her to the field and digs a pot of soil, then comes back. And then she pours that soil over the head of her mother um, which, as we can see, there is the link between the daughter who's the bride to be her mother and then the mother earth that the mother is sitting on, which is that decorated platform of packed earth. And then, of course, for the Santal and Ho, there are the rituals in the Jahair or the sacred grove, which were all performed on the ground, creating little um, geometric shapes on the ground, which became abodes for the different bonga. Um, into whom uh, sacrifice was being offered. Um, and here again, the earth itself played a very important role in those rituals. And then, of course, there's also the celebration of Raja Sankranti um, with uh, all of those swinging and nonsense songs to cool and fan Mother Earth um, during her period of fertility or menses. And the parents were burying their baby's placenta in the soil at the front doorstep of their homes. And then we had the gendered fertility ritual roles around paddy seed sowing and growing and the economic values of soil with house construction from clay and different utensils and so on. As we can see, most of the houses there were made from clay dug straight from the soil um, right there on the spot. Um, this was also there, you know, the making of utensils and roof tiles and so on by the village potter. So children are living in an environment where clay has both those cultural values and as well as these um, livelihood values. So soil was also a primary medium or constituent in children's play. 
And as I mentioned, my title for this play, paper, Play on the Mother Ground, is celebrating um, not only um, that the, the mother's um, interactions with children, but also Earth as mother um, for the children in this play. For example, um, when I was there, I asked some of the, the children, do you ever play with dolls? And they said, oh, yes, we love playing with dolls. And I said, oh, can I, can I see some of your dolls sometime? And they said, auntie, we have to make them first. And I said, oh, how do you make them? And they said, oh, we get the clay from the village pond and then we make them and then uh, we dry them in the sun for a little while and then we dress them with little bits of cloth and then we play. And they said, next time we play with them, we'll call you. And they did. Uh, and I saw they'd made not only little dolls, but also little figurines of um, bullocks and pots and pans. And then they, you know, did um, little um, games, you know, about picnics and uh, little dramas and things like that with all of their um, creations. And then again, uh, many of the games that the children were playing were drawn, when they were playing board games, were literally drawn straight onto the soil. And um, also I noticed that when kids were even playing active games, whether it be cr cricket or comedy or any of these kind of things, quite often a child would just squat down and touch their head onto the ground as if to ask the, the earth to, to support them in winning, you know. So I'm going to talk about two cases of two different types of games, sitting down and active. Here again, we can see the children playing with soil. <clears throat> so in most of the um, board games, the children started by creating their own dice and counters out of seeds and stones, and then drawing the board onto the earth with a finger or stick and then entering that magic circle of the game. And th this reminded me of the priest's rituals in the Jaher or the sacred grove. Of course, this rests on purely abstracted behaviors, drawing geometric diagrams on the soil and manipulating objects in it. But this is simply to mention that games engage with core motifs. In a print media world, children play with printed board games that they get from the shops and they play cards. In a digital domain, adults can conduct all their important work on their computers, and you'll often see that children in homes with computers will, like their parents, be playing digital games on computers. Um, so in those senses, the core motif for both symbolic and economic livelihood was the computer. But in agroforestry agro environments, children play with and on soil to a large extent. Here is one of the games, it's called Dum Darap. It's kind of a bit like, um, what do you call it? Uh, a bit like noughts and crosses, but slightly different. Um, and a, a loved game was Astang, which is uh, very similar to Ludo. This game, Handelman and Schulman have described how um, in the Elephanta and Elora caves, there are big sculptural depictions of this game being played by Shiva and Parvati. And they describe how this game involves the dispersal of self fragmented self-representations. So four little tokens assigned to each player represents different parts of the self, all moving towards the point of ultimate reintegration in the central home space of the board. And one variant of this game known as Gyan Chapur is the source of the familiar game Snakes and Ladders, where throwers of the dice regulate their tokens movement by way of dangers, traps and bonuses towards the higher realms of the cosmos, cosmos the upper limit of the board. Um, so we can see that India actually is the source of so much play uh, that has now become popularized over the whole world. As we know, the game of chess comes from India, Ludo comes from India, Snakes and Ladders comes from India. In fact, there is another play scholar um, whose name is eluding me right now, who did work um, in the um, Indus and Harappa. Um, and she discovered that 
every tenth artifact that was discovered was a play artifact. And so we can see that there is an ancient, ancient cultural history of, of um, play in India. Here is another um, game. What's this one? This one is, um, it's kind of like a Chinese checkers kind of variant. <clears throat> so what's the significance of all of this? Um, playing with dominant resources and motives, such as soil, seeds and stones, is not, in my view, merely pre-practice for future adult roles as agriculturalists. Um, and it's also not just a predetermined engagement with assigned meanings of resources and motives. What I found by hanging out with children and playing with them is that alongside those games, the act of play was opening up a space for banter, um, chit chat, and freedom from ordinary social mores. Um, while playing with materials and objects of value, which in this case I'm saying is soil, which is of high value to agriculturalists, young people were gossiping and joking as they developed their own generational peer sense-making, um, sometimes parodying um, the, the things that are going on in their world. At the same time, exploring dexterous, enjoyable activities with open-ended possibilities and potential. So, of course, there's this joy in the enskillment um, that um, is going on, but there's also this side banter that's going on at the same time. And that's, that's happening, you know, which is why it's sometimes important for adults just to give a little space to children to have these uns unsupervised moments because there is uh, an important generational peer sense-making about the world that young people are engaging in while they interact with their peers. Another element that I'd like to just comment on is the self-reliance in prop making. There's a high degree of self-reliance amongst cultivator forestry communities. Judge money economies still occupy a key place and children grow up participating in and observing the manufacture and exchange of a wide range of locally produced and consumed products, such as the potters making the roof tiles or you know, people making the local bricks for the houses, the weavers on their hand looms, ironsmiths pro producing many of the tools that the agriculturalists use, um, and local people producing their own food staples with, you know, their own rice storage, storage um, happening. And then the basket weavers who would also weave those gigantic uh, baskets that rice gets stored in. And also, as I mentioned, the bricks and other house construction material. And seeing all of this, children also were very self-reliant and creative in their own play prop creation. They were carving cricket backs and ho hockey sticks, making copper balls, ceramic discs, dolls, bows and arrows, slingshots, sand structures, game props, and also make-believe props. As you can see there, there's some carved, hand-carved cricket backs. And here are some of the little, you know, dolls and figures that the children would make from um, clay from the pond. So all of this was actually really honing um, skills of improvisation, adaptation and resourcefulness and malleability. And this translated to other fields too. For example, when I gave the children the use of um, the video camera, um, one of the boys that used it, he immediately cottoned on to using the, um, the rewind delete to do um, in-camera edits so that he in the end was able to do new takes and create a beautiful, <laughs> you know, almost completely edited film just through the camera, which is quite a skill. Um, and one day there was a festival that was going on and the children really wanted a sound system. So one child rode a bike off to another village and picked up a megaphone and another child went to somebody's house and picked up a car battery and somebody else went and got an inverter and somebody else got a um you know a music you know i don't know was it a cassette player or something you know a cd player and then they brought it all together wired it all up attached it to a bicycle and then they pushed the bicycle through the village blaring out loud music and having you know a great dance so 
this again for me just showed that they were growing up with you know great creativity and um, uh, um, innovation and resourcefulness. Um, and as you can see, even here we see the um, what do you call it? I think this is palash, the game of knocking down the the ceramic tower. The kids also made the the ball and the ceramic um, tower. Um, so. So, so far we've looked at continuities between modes, motifs and resources, but I also want to note that games represent an index and an actual site of transformations inside the vi rural villages in two ways. Firstly, um, as central motifs and resources change, so do the modes of games. And secondly, games are an open-ended context within which young people develop their own peer perspectives and their own responses to their social, historical, and spatial circumstances through the conversations, exchanges, and sense-making which accompany their play interactions. This, in turn, is a way that young people impact and transform their local spatial contexts. So, for example, concrete roads are an iconic development motif in rural areas, and they're growing. You know, a lot of the unsealed roads are becoming concretized. Um, and then immediately the children use the concrete road rather than the bare earth as a crucial site for certain types of board games and active games. Chalk lines re replace stick lines drawn on the earth. Um, roads also bring access to the block headquarters where market products were more readily available and gradually plastic bag balls were replacing copper balls. And empty bottles, wire, and discarded refuse are new sources of play prop material. But I don't think that ch children were not only interested in using sort of leftover materials for their play props. Children were profoundly interested in testing and exploring esteemed social objects. And of course, most recently, digital technologies such as mobile phones um, are highly um, esteemed social <laughs> objects, and amongst children, these were immediately valued, amongst other things, as a gaming device. And again, um, in developed villages where electricity was present, television is available, and children, especially girls, were spending more time indoors watching movies. Um, schooling also had its influence. When kids go to school, they get a new territorial identity linked with their school grounds, which changes their forms of play. Um, there's obviously more gender segregation, age segregation. I found less games were being played by girls. Um, and there was banning or discouragement of some of the more tactile games that are played in the villages after school and a greater emphasis on competitive sports. But what I also noticed was that Again, if we link games with um, spatial or geographic environmental awareness of children, I noticed that um, this engagement with sports competition was opening out young people's geographical identification um, through such thing as inter-village um, sports competitions, block level sports competitions, district level, state level. Um, and some children um, in my advantage had also attended um, national level games. And also, of course, everybody is tuned into um, <laughs> international cricket, for example. And so all of this is uh, their engagement with sports and games was um, opening them to different geographic identities. So many changes to children's games are the results of um, responses to adult determined macro structural forces. Um, that are beyond children's control, such as new roads and digital technologies and the influences of school, etc. Um, so that's the ways that children's games are changing because of the forces that are adult determined. Now, if we want to identify the ways that children themselves are enacting rural transformation, we actually need to turn to a different kind of register. As Turner notes, the most creative human spaces are on the margins, along interstitial zones. 
Children's play is a creative engagement with space. Um, it's the bending of existing forms to one's will, not the manufacture of form from nothing. Play and creativity takes place in a field of environmental cultural possibilities and plays as much processes of recombination as it is about making something from nothing or making something anew. Games and other expressions of play are sites where young people interact with and make sense of changes in their physical environment and reach their own peer generational understandings about um, their positions in a changing world. They formulate creative peer responses to externally imposed, imposed changes in their landscapes, but their games are this field of open-ended and uncertain outcomes that are immediate and broader. And as we bear in mind, you know, we, we have to face changes. It's part of what our world is. And play is so important because it is teaching us to continually um, maintain that, that non-calcified adaptive potential inside ourselves. Children's game sites are also providing them with this embodied coupling with the continuities and change changes in sensory patterns, shapes, sounds, textures, smells, and affinities of place, which are all opportunities to exercise this adaptive potential. Finally, let me just say that play is a way that these young people experienced deep embodied intersubjective peer understandings about human, non-human, and environmental interplays in a way which is filled with um, enjoyment and joy which again is, is such an important um, part of our, um, you know, to, to have those experiences is so important um, for our own lifelong well-being. So I'd like to just um, end there and um, to, um, to thank you for your indulgence to listen to that. And I look forward to your um, comments and thoughts.